What's going on, Reef Builders? I'm Jake Adams, and we have the specialist video that all of you guys have been asking for. I got my good friend, Mark Vanderwall. Good to see you, man, in he, person. Yeah, here in town. I hadn't seen this guy in like seven years, MACPA 2014. Fort Lauderdale? Yeah, yeah, it's been a really long time. So, Mark and I, I feel, are going to give a better, like, duo tour of the entire Reef Builder studio and we're gonna walk around everything and just kind of talk about the tanks. So yeah, I, I stopped by on Monday for a real quick stopover because uh, I had a, had a break in the schedule to drive up and we hung out and got some initial impressions and uh, definitely blown away. Uh, I think, I'm, I know you don't have every coral known to man, but it sure feels like it when you're here. <laughs> every it, coral I brought up, I was like, hey, remember that one coral? And you'd be like, oh, okay, just come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually one of the things I'm kind of aiming to do here at the studio is have a demonstration of just like the whole swath of reef aquarium equipment, of reef aquarium techniques, and reef aquarium animals. So we're gonna take a big tour around the studio. Um, we're gonna finish up on this tank. This is the, uh, the eight foot, 400 gallon reef tank. Uh, it's the one I've been wondering about as, as well, like what, what your goals were with it. I saw the video when you put it on the stand, which was pretty nerve wracking to watch, by the way. Yeah, no, we've done a <laughs> few videos of this, of, this, of this tank. Yeah. Where we're gonna tour the entire studio, and then we're gonna end up on this tank and, and discuss why it's not set up yet. But one tank that has been featured a lot is the Red Sea Max Nano. Yeah, and I love like you come through the front door and you're just greeted with the Nano and you've got the big contrast of the huge tank over there as well just to give a sense of scale of how small it really is. And the other thing that I just, uh, I, when you did the um, update video on it, the fact that it went without a water change for as long as it did and yet you have healthy stony coral growth just mystifies me by the way. It's, um, it's really funny because we set up this tank primarily to show people how to set up a reef tank. Yep. And then when it started happening, we we're like, oh, we can do this in one day. Yeah. And then my entire plan the whole time, tank, um, when Ryan came down, we just wanted to do a, a, a simple how-to video of how to set up a reef tank. Yeah. And then um, it kind of turned into like a one day build, right? Because there's this long standing ideas that you need to, Oh, wait forever uh, and yes. ever and then another week to, 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 to like enjoy your corals. So, so then it turned into a one, tan, one day nano reef tank build. And then you've heard, you've heard people talk about like, don't put your hands in your tank. There's some people who really believe in that. Um, after two months, it didn't have a water change. It looked amazing. After three, four months, it didn't have a water change. It still looked amazing. And so then the idea came to mind of like, all right, let's not just only set up a reef tank in one day, yeah. but then let it go one year, not just without a water change, but without putting my hands in the tank. Why yeah, do you put it. my hands in the tank for a year, which is hell, hella funny because these clownfish did, did, ended up being really aggressive. Like me and Evan, like I thought Evan was being a wussy because he would put his hands in there and they would attack. But then I put my hands in there and they won't stop. They will just keep biting and biting and biting. They're just not used to it, so you look like an invader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Evan, I want you to zoom in a little bit on this algae that we have here because, you know, we want to keep that real uh, reef aquarium life. There's some algae going on in there. There's a couple errant aptasias. And just if you have, be because you have those in your reef tank, it's not the end of the world, right? It's when they get out of control. And honestly, if it, if it stayed at this level, it would never be a problem, yeah. right? And um, to be honest, this is the most neglected tank in the entire Reef Builder studio because it's on the back side of this tank, which I can't see from my desk. So you don't always have a clear line of sight on I it. I never have a clear line of sight, yeah. but I don't mess with it. I don't dose it. Uh, you know, we, we, we scrub it down. I have not tweaked the spectrum since day one. This is a Red Sea Reef Lead 50. This is an awesome little nano light, not a plug. It's just the reality. Um, so they did a really good job with this tank. And people will always ask what's in the chamber. I don't even know what's in the chamber, man. There's, there's like a weird um, kind of very fine micron sock here that I periodically put. Oh, it's that thin kind that yeah. breaks the detritus down yeah. versus clogging, right? And I have put some chemical medias in the past, yeah. but it's just not all of it. And then I don't even know if the skimmer's running. Yeah, the skimmer's running and it's, it's been cleaned, I don't know. 
I Three love this, times. by the way. This is like primo. I, I've talked about it a lot on reef therapy that why don't they just come out with glass lids for some of these tanks that s may struggle with high evaporation issues if their volume of water is so small, right? If, if we didn't have the glass lid, this would, tank would absolutely need an auto top off. So uh, it comes with, no, did it come with that? I don't even think it came with this. I think no, we had to build that. Well, I don't know. I, I know my Red Sea did not. Uh, yeah, so we had to build that, but then I put this on top to reduce evaporation. So, um, I mean, this thing can go how many weeks, seven, two, three weeks before, yeah. you know, topping off? Yeah. So it's not really, yeah, that's as much as you would top off a reservoir for an ATO. So, well, and this is the perfect example of, you know, reef tanks are hard. It's like, no. I mean, I think you're, knowledge and your your history with the hobby obviously you're going into it with a lot of expertise and you know what some of the warning signs are to look for but i mean in the grand scheme of things i think especially if you keep your evap in check you know you choose some hardy corals you can have a nice reef tank and not really touch it all that much you know yeah yeah and so we put um, some of the palithoa grandis in there i don't know maybe that like was a, recent right like a month ago and they're, yeah. they're settling in they're settling in pretty what good what about the monty how long has he been in there? Um, right around the same time. I don't okay. think I showed that on video, but for certain corals, you'll see as we walk through all the tanks, um, we want the same coral in tank after tank after tank after tank, sort of for redundancy, but also as an experiment to see how low can it go, how <laughs> bright can it go, you know? So that's um, the one super thin branch monopora I call the Manila Spy. I love that. I'm going to call it a, a Malu, Heteractus Malu. I may be off on the ID, but I have one that I ordered under that namesake that's a doppelganger to that one. Um, I had to isolate mine out because I was highly suspicious that it was um, stinging my fish every once in a while. Yeah. Um, so uh, Mark's talking about that anemone down in there. Yeah. I actually had it right where the red Monty is, and it crawled basically in the shade. Yeah. And it stayed there, and the clownfish have never touched it. Oh, really? So, like, I forget that, that it's in there. Yeah, they're sand dwellers, too. So if, if the Malu ID is right, so that would explain why he went, he went down instead of up like a ridder eye or something. I spend so little time looking at this tank. It's almost as we're watching it, I'm like, oh, what's going on in yeah, this tank? Well, what are you talking about? What's yeah, in there? I don't really, really know. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, you know, the green star polyp kind of took off like everybody said it would. But uh, we got a lot of tanks to get through. So let's keep moving along. Here we have the Cade, I think they called it the 900 S2. Um, this is my lower light LPS kind of dominated aquarium. We have two uh, Blaze Illumagic minis. So I think they're just about 50 watts each um, and they shift spectrum. There's no, this is the only tank that has no whites on it whatsoever. Um, got my custom made little hanger bar but as you'll see in some, uh, a lot of the tanks that I want to show off, we're going to start really leaning into some of the strip lighting aspect. Um, we've got uh, Nero 3 on both sides blowing behind yeah, this large wall. I'm not quite sure why, but a weird black encrusting algae has kind of like taken over the rock, which is neat in one sense because it makes the corals pop. But it's also kind of weird. <laughs> I don't know where I kind of like from. it, by the way. I have no idea how. It's got more of a I, versus like the typical crusty coralline. It's got a little more of like a softer feel to it, like almost velvety, you know. And it mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be causing any problems. So I'd rather have that than like stark white rock. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. This is a cool aquascape. Uh, I remember when you were putting it together. I understood through the video what you were trying to do, but I had a hard time really visualizing it in my head. But uh, now that I've seen it in person, it's, it's pretty wicked. So you might see that some of the scolies are missing. Uh, have been, the only thing this tank is missing right now is uh, curation, right? So I took out some scolies because I was doing some work in here. I had a couple scolies fall into um, a Lobo, so I lost mm. one of them. And I was like, all right, I took the, the most prized ones until I know I could put them back on and secured. Yeah. And because this is like the lower energy environment, I start putting bubble corals in here, but they've just like, taken over so i need to find another spot to put my bubble corals to make this get this back more to the cinerinas homophilias scolies and the micromusa lords like and and actual micromusa and a few blastos up there in the corner um so yeah this tank is doing really well 
It did have a pretty nasty explosion of bubble algae. I saw some hints of it, but I mean, that's, again. Dude, you can't even imagine how bad it got initially. What'd you do to treat it, though? Nothing. It just went away? I did nothing. No, I mean, I mean, I added like a couple emerald crabs. Okay, yeah. And still... um, that's about it. And, but it was slow. And you know, a couple places where the bubble algae was really like creeping up on the corals, like I cleaned them up so they weren't like encroaching on the scolies. But other than that, I haven't really done much. There's so many tanks here, and I've had full-time help for about a month now. And so now we're you know, gonna be able to switch gears and really start to curate this tank. I'm gonna try to show off each of the sumps of every tank. So we have a, let's see, we have a Delua Australia Great White DC Protein Skimmer. Um, a tiny bit of carbon in there that's way past expired. Um, I have the E-Coral doser set up. I've dosed nothing to this tank the whole time I've had it. Calcium and alk is holding st steady? Dude, I mean, they're low light corals. And yeah, you do a water slow change, grow. I don't know, maybe every two months or something. You know, there's like a little detritus that builds up right here in one spot, and that's it. So you three know. takeaways for me with this tank. One, I'd never seen a Cade in person, and I really dig the clear silicone over the black. That's yeah. a nice change of pace. Absolutely. Um, just talking about this clear silicone right here that just kind of disappears a little bit more than the black. Did you see this, the power center? No. Oh, man. Every tank should have that. You know, I don't know if it needs both strips. Yeah, I was because, about to say, that's a lot of Because power. when I first plugged it in, um, there was only they only took up the first strip. <laughs> um, I really like the side access panel doors. Oh yeah, I call it the suicide door. Yeah. If I haven't come in here and like show off like how it comes in from the side. It makes so, if, I mean, if you're a real hobbyist reefer, this makes so much difference as far as accessing the things. And I had a custom stand made once when I did like a whole deep sea aquatics tank, which they're no longer around, but, um, and I paid extra for that suicide door. And it was money, you know, to, to have that access to the side, especially because you can fit a much larger sump in yep. as well, because you're not dealing with center bracing uh, between the cabinet doors. Um, but the other thing I really love is the lineatus rasses. Those are just gorgeous. Yeah. And then you're talking about filtration, and this sort of becomes a theme on all of your other tanks is the simplicity of it. You know, because you go on the forums and people just go so crazy with their sumps, and if that's their thing, Mac Daddy plumbing and all of that, colored PVC, that's great. Uh, but it just, it doesn't take a lot to run a reef tank. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of um, Ali's systems in, in one of your reef builders videos. You know, it's just a skimmer or sump. Oh yeah, his um, Japanese style reef aquascape, it's been going for like 12 years. Yeah. Three plugs. Yeah. Three plugs. I don't even think he has a skimmer on there, right? He's got the return pump, a flow pump, and the metal halide, but he's still yeah. using the metal halide. So and it yeah. just gets me thinking about failure rates on things, because we've talked about that too, is the less things you have, the less things that fail, and also the less things you have, the more easier it is to have redundancies for those things, yeah. right? Just yeah. have another skimmer pump on the shelf or something. Yeah, no, I'm glad you noticed that. But like I said, the only thing this tank needs is some curation. I got a bunch of goodies to put in this tank, so we're gonna be putting in some videos of like souping up this tank here in the near future. Looks good, man. All right, here's something you don't see very often anymore, is a saltwater fish only aquarium. <laughs> so I have had some challenges as an aquarist. I lost the tiger angel fish. Um, there was some really nasty flukes going around and I battled and just towards the end of the treatment, he just did not pull through. But um, got my tinker eye angel fish, line spot trigger, mixed in with mollies, flag fin angel. Um, I got the yellow tang as the, the same time as the black tang, and so we call him DMX. That is a 15-year-old used aquarium fish. That thing is massive. So he's lived in reef tanks or saltwater tanks longer than most people have ever even kept one. And, that's, and he's just such a great aquarium fish. I'm going to go grab some food and feed him. But yeah, one thing you'll notice thing. is uh, all the decorations, you know, they looked really goofy at first when I had white, fake, you know, uh, Greek uh, columns in here, and then the, the blue, blue Ridge. Easter Island. Um, you know, this was kind of yellowish, and these were kind of brownish, but I knew that on a long enough timeline in a fish tank, they're all just gonna become the same color mm -hmm. of biofilm algae. All the same color. And uh, the only, you know, 
One of the things I'm not super thrilled about is I made one giant glass top, basically, out of um, greenhouse like siding, green, greenhouse wall siding or something. And uh, it keeps the tank really warm. But so oh, I, this thing right here, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, there's a name for it. I forget what it's called when it's got uh, those little Greenhouse cells. siding. Is it? OK. Yeah. OK. So like every tank, I want to show So you off. don't get the evap cooling effect. I get no evap cooling. So gotcha. I did put a fan on here recently because the temperature had gotten up to like 83-ish, 84. And the flag fin was just acting a little weird. Like, you know, like he was overheating in his brain and just, he still ate, but he was just swimming a little weird. I'm like, yeah. okay, that must, that must be my, my note. Um, so I really like this Reef Octopus That's home. a beast of a skimmer. It's a beast of a skimmer that we usually run at like 40 to 60%. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, occasionally, if we're like, we're doing a, I'm, honestly, because there's no sand, because none of this is live rock, waste doesn't build up in here. Right, so well, we I like your waste collection. Speaking of, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, this is the waste collector, which we featured before. We hid the float switch kind of behind the brace. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted to, again, it's so clean, we don't have to mess with it very much. But if we wanted to, we could do like some wet skimming and just let it go to town because we have an automatic uh, gravity top off here. And so this whole thing could fill up, trip the uh, float switch, Come on. Uh -huh. and just just turn off the pump. That's, yeah. And I mean, I see that you got some of the bio bricks, but it's not, you know, overboard biological filtration with a fish only, right? Yeah. Sort of what we talk about, like bacteria grows everywhere. Mm hmm Yeah, that's the thing. I, I do believe, believe in bacteria, and I don't think you need that much. This is the main biological filter. Yeah. Right? In the event of a power outage, I would just have um, some airline up in here and this entire thing would be the filter and this is just the thing that helps keeps the nutrients down um, So I do have some plans to switch up this tank a little bit. Um, I've got that six-foot bow front over there and I want to um, Kind of redo it and make sure to have the automatic filter roll installed from day one, because that's going to export all the waste. Oh, that's perfect for a fish only, right? Yeah, perfect, yeah. perfect for a fish only. Just catch all those big poops before they can even hit the protein skimmer. So but right now, we're just using a couple built-in filter socks, and they get clean about once a week. I love your indigo hamlet, by the way. Gorgeous. Yeah, the indigo hamlet's interesting because I love hamlets, and he still has one inch to go before he'll turn into his beautiful, like, white striped blue self. No joke, it took him about one year to become an aquarium fish. Really? Right? Just two to three months of super shyness, and then another six months of like he's starting to kind of come out to eat. And then finally, he's all like, okay, I'm safe here. I can hang out with all the big dogs. And uh, there he goes. Well, you got quite the dither fish collection, too, to you know, coax him out to say, hey, all's well yeah yeah and he's got a big mouth so he eats kind of like the same as the other fish i'll throw in a little bit of krill in here we'll see who goes for it it's i throw in the krill mostly for the trigger for the trigger fish and he takes him he's kind of dumb it takes him a while to figure out that there's some good shrimp pieces floating at the top but what's yeah. the story on these lights um, these are Aquamax lights, just kind of normal reef lights. I just love how they're, they're, they're so low Out profile. Of sight, yeah. I do wish they were white, just because everything here, or blue, you know? Yeah. I could paint them, but I, I have tried some other lights, and they just have a good spread, and you know, I can, I can easily dial in the, the color, so just press uh, whichever channel you want to play with, so I can turn down the whites real fast. Boom, just like that. So I am frequently tweaking the, uh, the, the spectrum. Everything's on super bright right now for the video because cameras need as much light as possible. But yeah, otherwise, that's a pretty good little dealie. What, what's your, I mean, for fish only, what's your water change schedule like? Uh, man, we, we kind of feel it out. Mm. Um, we don't go more than a month. We don't go more than six weeks. And then when we do a water change, it's just like, boom. Uh, 50 percent 75 percent just just reset the the, the nutrients um, I know that's not like what the average hobbyist is gonna do but um, it works for us cool. but here's the water change system since we're talking about water changes so 
I, we've featured this before, and I, I, I love this because to me, this is like almost a different aquarium, right? <laughs> this entire system. It's fully plumbed, and yeah. I've seen it replicated since because it took me a long time to figure out how do I make a, a, a water management system oh, with sorry. one pump. So we have a Vectra M2 that is plumbed into both of these. Valve in, valve in, valve out, valve out, and this is the outlet. Um, the, all the fresh water comes in here first, and that's on a float valve. And this is, this is all the water purification you see right here. We just changed the mechanical filter for the first time in three years, about two weeks ago. And it's just not, I mean, there's, there's minerals in our water, but not a lot. And then we have uh, four very high capacity carbon blocks. They're each rated for 5,000 gallons, so 20,000 gallons total. And I have a, an actual like digital flow meter here that tells me how much water I'm up to. So I'm up to 1,204 gallons. And then once that hits 5,000 gallons, I just change out all of the, all of the carbon. So, so you do them all at once. Yeah, because you know there's a whole staggered approach, but I'm just like, you know what? It's, it's about 50 bucks for 5,000 gallons of water. <laughs> That's a penny per gallon, so keep my carbon fresh, keep everything yeah. fresh, but yeah, it goes in here. Um, and these are just very well linked, and this also will, will pump anywhere we need if we're, we're, we're refilling top offs or if we're doing a water change. So this is fresh water, salt water, and uh, we got the graduated measurements. And I see you've got a quite the salt collection going down there. Yeah, so this whole thing was built like holistically, right? Yeah. From the beginning, I knew I wanted to store the salt and I knew I wanted the vats a little higher in the event of, I don't know, some you know power failure or something. I could still get water down where I need it. And so, um, I, man, we're, we're reaching back almost three years when I first built this stand. And a lot of viewers commented like, hey, man, I don't think that's going to hold it up. <laughs> so then I shored it up. I actually got my engineer brother in here to, to talk to me about torsional uh, forces or something, you know, and then I, I basically I, I made it the same way some of the old school stands are made. I just put a giant piece of plywood on the front, on the back, and cut out some windows so I can store all my accuracy salt. That is a lot of accuracy salt. Yeah, I, I really believe in it, man. Yeah. It, it mixes up so clear, so clean. It's Julian Sprung's recipe that he mixes up himself, you know? What? Yeah, so that just, that means a lot to me. Um, if you don't know about this salt, uh, each 50 gallon bag is like specially measured. You know about this, right? I do know you're, that part. You're that, supposed to use the entire bag 50 pounds right. at a time. So that you don't get the settlement in the mega bucket of yeah. some of the heavier, yeah. And he also has five gallon bags, but we're pretty adept at almost always, um, this will actually mix about 45 gallons to the salinity that we want. Okay. So we will generally kind of shoot um, for a little higher salinity to, and then we can just very easily add some fresh water to adjust after that. Oh, that's a good point. So instead of breaking up a bag and, and stuff like that, I'm still learning how to do it. Um, but yeah, this, this will do the, the, the recirculation of this well, tank. And this is a good example. I think people forget how, that you're very tall. So you see these videos and, and so from a sense of scale, man, like I get, I'm six feet tall. <laughs> I'm six feet tall, I can't reach it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And there was a lot of that in the, in the studio where um, not that things look small in the video, but you just, you have a sense of scale in the video and then you come see it in person and you're like, oh my God, that tank is much bigger in person than I, I, I pictured it. And the corals as well. And I, I think part of it, maybe my theory is you're a very tall guy. So you, you can dwarf things in the, yeah. in the, in the video a bit. Um, but yeah, that is a huge the, reservoir. Um, a couple other tricks is I got Uniseals here. We use Spot Flex just to get a real nice smooth uh, flow into the tanks. Um, we, I do have like an eight inch filter sock in here that, so that when this is recirculating, it cleans the water, filters the water. Okay. Um, and that needs to be cleaned about once a year with accuracy, uh, with other salts um, much sooner. What is the story on this Vortec, by the way? Uh, you know, so when the <laughs> studio first started getting set up, um, I was really about customizing as much as possible. So I, had, I literally had some old um, EcoSmart uh, uh, 
mm, controllers. Yeah. And I switched out the electronics from the quiet drive oh, to okay. the old thing and even brought over this one. But I also painted them so that the buttons would be white. And you can see the, the on off button is pretty much the one that we, we use. So I painted the, uh, the spacer blue. I painted the pump white. You can see it goes down to black. That's so pretty, that's recirculation. That's cool. And uh, yeah, that's where we're at. All right, so the last thing I want to show you in the workshop is my collection of vintage reef aquarium, or general aquarium gear, right? So some of it's just for reef and some of it for just aquarium. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I recognize so much of it too. Um, you got the, that's got to be pre-Eheim, right? That yep. Ebo? That's an original uh, Eheim, I'm sorry, Ebo Jaeger heater. It's all green inside. Nice. All, all these boxes have the product inside of it. I've got my reef link up here because I know it's only a matter of time before that's going to get discontinued. Um, got my big job algae pad for, uh, with a dock with dock wellfish. So they still sell these, but not with a dock wellfish on it. So this was all about like having new inbox gear. And uh, man, I just love having my uh, original uh, oh Maxi Jet. I didn't even notice this guy just till now. Yeah, the Turbo Flow Bubble Up Slim Jim. Uh huh. Um, we've got the original Tetra Luft uh, pump, not in the box. I've got, uh, these are two of my favorites right here, the old, old 1980s style Tetraman container. I mean, look at that Art Deco, man. It's just so freaking beautiful. Uh, yeah, I don't know. How I can smell it. Like, you know, do you remember when you were a yes. kid and you open up that Tetraman? <laughs> it always, it smelled good to me. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm weird, but I, I love the smell of that flake food. <laughs> this one's empty. Um, uh, this is one of my favorites, an original can of Cyclopes. This was kind of the food that like turned especially the SPS guys, uh, onto feeding. And I remember my Anacros would catch this stuff. So it's got stuff in it, but it's like 20 years old. It's gotta be a, a little funky. That's a fun one. Um, and then I love having my, my old school hydrometer. So this is the original one that only went to 1.017, specific gravity meter, right? Doesn't say salinity, because it doesn't measure salinity, it measures specific gravity, which you can translate. So this is the original one. And then later on, they made a full range specific gravity meter, right? I never even caught on to that, that there was a, a difference like that. Uh, you, you'd think I would have read the fine print at some point. Yeah. Um, the, I, the deep six to me, I mean, obviously we're in the age of refractometers and stuff, but to me that was such a game changer when it came out because one, getting the water level perfectly on these aquarium systems to that black line yep. was always a pain in the butt, whereas these auto, you know, just you dunked them and they had the right water level and you, it kept your hands dry. So you Mostly could, the design here prevented micro bubbles from that getting, was the on, other, the, yeah, from getting on the about swing that. arm. So yeah. I have a new one of these in the box on the way. I finally pulled the trigger on with the old Core Life uh, branding and stuff. And then these are new in box from the 1980s. I mean, you got to admit, whoever went from that and thought that up, you know, somebody buy that guy a beer back in the day. Um, so if uh, any of the viewers watching right now have a bottle, uh, empty or not, of original Mark Weiss Coral Vital, I'm trying to add that to the shelf. And also the original Mark Weiss Moonlight, because that was the original uh, reef, I mean, aquarium LED product um, that everybody bought. I mean, I had a few and I, I can't find any now. I need to find yeah. one new in the box. So hit me up in the comments if you have one of those. I remember the Mark Weiss stuff that it was like an apple cider vinegar. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you think about it, that was probably the first example of carbon dosing. Uh, it, it probably was. They just didn't tell us, you know, what that, it was about. That that's what was happening. <laughs> cool. Well, let's take a loco at the, uh, the fish quarantine, fish hospital systems. So you notice they have two 10 gallon tanks, um, very well covered up with just with power filters and an air stone. Um, one thing about when you're, when you're treating fish, you, even if you have like a protein skimmer that, could, that compressed air, it will, will bring up the oxygen level uh, more than anything. And we actually just fed these guys, uh, the purple tile fish. And so these are, um, these are in a copper free quarantine uh, setup and they have like yesterday, they got a freshwater bath, blew off a bunch of flukes, and we actually ran fresh water through the 10-gallon tank for about 10 minutes um, to kind of reset it. So it's kind of like a, a tank transfer method in place. In place, yeah. Which you know may not 
address a lot of like the the crypto carrion, but it does address a lot of the other stuff, especially yeah. with the freshwater style. Fish aren't always going to come down with everything. Yeah. And so there are certain things you can do prophylactically. So I will generally run copper in this system. Um, but so this is copper free. This is just antibiotics because really, because it's got a blue. Is that methylene? That, no, that's just a light. Oh, okay. That's just a light. My this, bad. Is, this is a blue light, and this is like a warm light. This is the e shops. Uh, um, kind of refugium light or whatever gotcha. that they have. Um, so yeah, I bought a square, ta square tail tang. It's just like a yellow eye coal tang that doesn't have like the blue and doesn't come from Hawaii. So there's a big boy in there. Um, so these guys have antibiotics. It's just so much easier to, to do in a 10 gallon tank. Yeah, and I noticed the gutter guard, which I don't know if we did or didn't bring up in the um, tips and tricks, but I had that sitting in my bucket next to my desk because I was going to talk about it because that stuff is so handy. So yeah, we have it back here as a, you know, basically a fish preventer and Evan did an awesome job of like locking it in with just, just a magnet, right? So it's not like super techy, just use a magnet to keep the fish from jumping. And the one thing about tile fish is they are crazy jumpers. So we even covered up the outflow from this uh, power filter just to prevent the fish from like kind of bouncing up in there. But um, I, right when I got these, I called up Kevin Cohen and he gave me a couple tips. One was um, they can handle copper, but it tends to knock back their appetite. So that's why I did the copper furry quarantine. And also they used to put, take a bunch of pipes and glue them into like a little pyramid, kind of like the old uh, ghost knife home. Yeah, yeah. And they took those away because the fish would just hide all the time and never come out. So I just made a little ledge where they can kind of like wedge themselves in there and yeah. still see when it was feeding time. So yeah, these guys eat incredibly well. I think three of them are eating gangbusters. A fourth one is still kind of figuring out, just eating mysis. And it's, it's kind of insulting, man, because sometimes I'll throw some flake in there just to try it, and they'll eat it and spit it right back out. Yeah. Like, come on, man, come on. So, so these are you know, two different smaller hospital tanks that we can do kind of a more intensive treatment yep. or just special conditions. And this is the long-term conditioning. I believe that that, is he Picasso snowflake? I think it's a snowflake back there. He's been in here for over two years. <laughs> He's been over here for over two years. Um, but this is a mode rack, not currently using the top. It leaks out a little bit of water. That's where this water's coming from. It's not you know, foolproof. But I did replumb it um, to my preferences. And so this is like the long-term conditioning. So it's, usually we won't do too much treatment in here. Okay. Um, but this is where the fish go to just become aquarium fish, eat very well, and figure out which tank they're going to go in and when. Have you messed with um, chloroquine at all? No. Phosphate? Mm -mm. I love that stuff because I can just retreat, 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 and it doesn't seem to have that long-term deteriorative effect of copper. Mm -hmm. um, and the other bonus is it kills all the algae, so you always have like the most spotless Q tank oh, ever. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, because you mentioned your clown, I've got a token uh, lats clown in my Q tank because I lost the mate, and he's one of the captive bred ones that has. Some deformities, yeah, you know, he's special. Some imperfections. Um, so he, he ended up as my uh, token quarantine fish to keep the biological filter going, but I've put him through chloroquine so many times. It, it became hard to get for a while because of COVID, but I think that's changing again. So you're using a blue lip, white bar clownfish <laughs> as a cycle fish, basically. Well, I can't put him anywhere else, right? Because I've got uh, a pretty old pair of perculas in my main display that are big whereas yeah. this guy's kind of a runt and you know I, I don't think they'd get along so so if you'll bring it in I'm just gonna the, uh, the the golden hamlet came out for the first time ever right before we shot this and he's gonna freak out but I'm gonna show him off anyway he's just hiding in there come on buddy there you go come on you can do it there we go he's 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 an active one so he's got kind of like that black front side but when he gets bigger he's gonna be solid gold with that blue edged black face and like I said, with the other indigo hamlet, it takes a long time for them to become um, acclimated, adjusted aquarium fish. Now we come into like the beginning of the meat and potatoes of the livestock here at the studio when it comes to, to corals. This is a four by eight coral flat. Um, each coral flat is, works independently. This one is completely independent, so it's just running off a, a calc reactor, um, an aqua vitro, 
250, Division 250 uh, protein skimmer. And then we have the Element Calcium Reactor, which is being auto-fed by uh, a Versa dosing pump. So these are all three of these are independent. I guess that makes sense. No, why this they, one is independent, and then those, those two, two are connected. OK, I yeah. got gotcha. you. So this is the tank where, kind of like the mode system, the corals, theoretically, they come here first. Gotcha. Right? If there's any kind of parasites that might affect fish um, or other corals, they go in here first. And I kind of hacked the Red Sea Reef Lead 160 to hang. So they're not supposed to hang, but man, they. It's weird because, oh God, I want to, <laughs> I want to be super sincere about it, right? You could see the coral yeah, colors the corals are awesome. Look great, yeah. But right now, this is as white as I can make it. Yeah. See, there's that push towards the blue too, which, I mean, it looks good. Don't get me wrong, but it's just never been my cup of tea, right? Yeah. So um, I'm actually a big fan. I'm sure you will be too, of actinic, right? That kind of purpley look. Yeah. And these have that too much. Just a little <laughs> bit too far. So these are like a good thing. They are awesome light, great value, and probably best used with some strip lights to to fine tune the spectrum because this is as white as it gets, and I think they use kind of a pinkish white uh, strip to complement the blues. The colors are amazing. The growth is perfect. The spread. I mean, you can see, I'm using three 160 watt LED lights to cover the entire tank. We've got clams in here, we've got acros, stylos, monopora. But yeah, this is the, um, the <laughs> kind of, it's like the first tank, but also the last tank. Well, and I gotta say, the output on the lights is impressive in terms of spread, considering how wide this tank is. Yeah, so um, one thing I did mention to you uh, um, on reef therapy is I've taken PAR measurements, and you know, right around here, not right under the light, but it's gonna be about 250 micromoles over here. Yeah. And the corals react like it's a lot more. So I, really? I, I feel like they just put a ton of spectrum into that pure royal blue that just drives photosynthesis some of those very hard. Sped, some of those wavelengths that are highly efficient par, like peak. Yes, yes. Yeah. So this is a, a giant colony of pipe organ. <laughs> I know, I, I initially mistook that for green star polyp, I'll be honest. Yeah, that's a giant colony of pipe organ. That coral is borderline a pest for us. <laughs> um, but I got three um, really nice blue squamosas. Yeah. Got a blue, royal blue tenuous. I'm a fan of blue corals because they look amazing under daylight spectrum I, from across the room. Um, but yeah, this is kind of like all the extra corals or the overgrown corals. So we got this, this giant mint Capnella that just that just drapes over other corals, and uh, some some of the pure nephthia that you were talking about. Yeah, we've talked about that. I was actually it took me a while to hunt some down. I should have just asked you, of course, but uh, that's such an underappreciated coral and such a great contrast to all the green stuff that's out there. This leather is fascinating to me. Yeah, nice large polyp jumbo. Yeah. What's weird is this Capnella will sting everything. It will sing other soft coral. It does not play well with others, right? And then so, like, you know, you have your neon green singularias, and we'll see a few more as we walk through. But here's like a medium branched, greener version. Yeah. Here's, here's a thinner branching, more mint pistachio version, right? So these are both green singularias, but they're also very different. Yeah, I have this one at home, and I bought it as a yellow Cinellaria, and it did come in yellow, but the minute it went under my LED lights, it, it greened up pretty good. Um, I've struggled with these guys, because I've ordered, I mean, probably not that exact one, right? But I've ordered just that really glow-in-the-dark Cinellaria, and they, they uh, even though I, I have this guy glowing in the dark, this guy goes more to a teal color, almost like that, yeah. under uh, my system, and I, I haven't figured out why yet, but you know, that's what keeps it interesting. This is a colony of Acanthastria echinata that I've had for about two years. I literally bought a chisel because I'm planning to just frag it up. Because I think once I frag it up, the orange will come back yeah. around the growth edges. Um, that, nice, yeah. nice classic Blue Ridge coral. One of the classics. Yep, yep, yep. Purple digitata. This guy's got a little recession because this um, uh, Cali tort fell into him, so it stung him a couple times. But, but yeah, there's a lot of fun corals. I'm going to hit you up for yeah, some of that. Some purple digi? Oh, yeah. You want some legit purple digi? I'm a digi, digi fan, man. Got the, the super orange digi. Um, this is the astro leather. 
that we talked about when you were over here on Monday. Yeah. So this guy just walks. He walks everywhere. Finally got him someplace, and this is all um, pipe organ. This stuff literally just sheds and goes everywhere and runs into stuff. And still continues just to grow that skeleton? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I see how it's encrusted there, you know? And yeah, and you know, we have like a, you know, little frags of red dragon. So here's a great example of how bright or weird these lights are. This red dragon is out of the direct sunlight, right? It's yeah. not over here like you would typically put an acro. I have it way <laughs> over here. So yeah, so when we have like random frags, we just kind of set them down. I'm trying to remember where this came from. <laughs> where did you come from? I think somebody sent me that. <laughs> but yeah, we have just like random frags until they're ready to get glued. And I'll put them on the edges because these lights, the, the, the par measurement doesn't really reflect what um, you'd expect the lights to do. Which is, uh, I've heard you say a lot about, you know, your opinions on par and you, you're, you're hitting at home with this tank, you know what I mean? Yeah. About you can get a par meter out, but really there's a, there's a lot more to the equation. Uh, observation. Yeah. Observation. These guys, don't forget it, that's. I, so these are the pizza anemones yeah. and they're not looking crazy, like they're healthy, but this guy had a real pink edge from the photograph and this guy had a crazy purple edge from the photograph. So I'm still trying to like fine tune and figure out how to keep those guys happy. That's a great anemone. And here you'll see <laughs> one of the more fleshed out coral systems. Oh man. A lot of stuff. This one is a, a little jumbly because I'm trying to make a bunch of frags for an upcoming frag show so I can get rid of corals, right? Things that we have a ton of like, so this is kind of funny because we have a bubble gum and a forest fire and I've had three expert companies in here and they couldn't tell me that which one was bubble gum and which one was forest fire. Still, still trying to figure out which one is which. So these two colonies literally just shed frags. Like there's five large yellow tangs in here and they just shed Keep frags and I'll have to pick them up. Yeah, and, you, you get know. a nice little... Uh... Yeah, those are the ones that are cleaned up. Yeah. These are the ones that just fell off. Man, and these tortuosas uh, on the outer side there are just amazing. Yeah. And just then, the um, blue on them, my goodness. Yeah, so this is the Immortal Tort that I collected in Solomon Islands in 2015. This is the California Tort, classic, classic, classic. Um, this is the Oregon Tort. Uh, this is a coral I collected in Australia in a couple of years, almost three years ago. Oh, man. Hoax am I? Or? Two years ago. Yeah, so that's, I call that the Hardline Hokey because it's basically, it was collected at the last reef. Mm -hmm. And this is a fun staghorn. Um, I got from Australia. This is a hobby frag that they call Derek's Indecision. What's the story behind that name? I don't know the name, <laughs> but it's got like, a, we'll see a couple more pieces, but it's kind of has a green mouth to the polyps, yeah. especially at the base. Here's a nice, perfect, flawless Langside cap that Evan Kemmerman actually grew out from a frag that I gave him that is gonna be moved to another tank. So, so here I wanna point out, uh, anytime I get new frags, acros, they'll go here, right? And they'll condition here and acclimate to the system. Once they really settle in, then they'll gl get glued to a real base. And I have the deep waters over here. And then you can see I have a bunch of the higher light acros now on their own base here and here and all over the place, just kind of mixed in. So when they're small, they go over here, get kind of, they got this, the trials right? And then they graduate to here. And as they get bigger, then they'll go in the acro system behind me. I like your, you got the Posilopores, Seriatopora, Stylophoras, all like gardening together. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's see, we've got just a, a green stylo, Milka stylo. We got a um, couple rainbows, a pink, this That's another is another coral and people just don't talk about it anymore. So underappreciated from I was speaking of corals from across the room, right? A nice pink stylo. Yeah. Well, under the right lighting, man, this thing is just glowing pink. Yeah. So this, I think, was an ORA piece, like just straight pink. And then this is just more of a recent maricultured piece. And you can see that they're not the same coral. This one's solid pink. This one has some green polyp hues. Yeah. Very fun. And I'm still working on that yellow <laughs> Fiji leather. I just. 
It's golden, it's more golden than it's ever been, but it's not that bright canary yellow um, that it used to be. I told you about mine, they were a mustardy yellow for a long time, and then when I switched to the Kessels, they started to green up a bit, which, you know, I don't want them to go that direction, right? I can get a green leather anywhere, so right, right. trying to figure out what the story is on those guys. These pipe organs are amazing. Yeah, so I have a couple more strains of pipe organ. I do believe they're different species. Yeah. Because the colony we saw before has like really whispery thin um, tentacles. And then these have, um, they've sometimes been called like the paddle fin. Mm -hmm. But if you get them super happy and you look really close, the, the, the pinule, pinules are not fused. Hmm. Like the pinules are just so dense that they look the same. So these two are the same. And then we have one over here that's a little bit more white. And certain corals that are taking too long to get happy, I just glue to the side <laughs> to get out of my way. This is all glued them to the side, be like, all right, you know, like uh, pony up or go away. So this tank is flowed again with that kind of recirculating mindset. We've got a Cche Synchro 9.0 here, um, just a regular nozzle. We've got a gyre, sorry, what was this? This was the jump gyre. And then there's also a Nero uh, 5 underneath this breeder oh, box yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, and that keeps all of the detritus ending up in one particular location. Um, this system can run independently. It's got its own calc reactor. And then the Ultra Reef Protein Skimmer, which just, dude, this thing destroys. It destroys nutrients. It got cleaned yesterday, so that's why it's super clean looking. Yeah, and you then, let me tinker with that thing on Monday and the weight of everything, the lid, everything, it's just heavy. It yeah. just feels like quality. Um, I guess also for lighting, I still have three uh, Gen 4 Pros with one Gen 5 Blue in the middle. Um, I still haven't asked for any more. This is a good time to give a shout out to channel sponsor, Ecotech Marine. Um, I've just been feeling it up for a long time and I have Virtually never use the uh, the cyan uh, with this cyan and lime green color channels. I've talked to a lot of other reefers too, who were just like, just just not really all about it. Mm. Yeah. So uh, this is a fun tank, and one thing you'll notice about the tank behind you and this one, there is no rock. Yeah. There is no rock. Everything is just purely corals. I got my token zoanthid collection that I'm like so ambivalent about. I just have a few token uh, bam bams some Hawaiian pallies, um, uh, we got the Rastas over here. I think these are, these are the eagle eyes, these are utter chaos, these are Midas touch, and that's about the end. Of, I think there's one uh, purple people eater right here because I have more pieces um, spread out in some other places. But yeah, if that one is like the super disorganized tank over there, this one starts become, becoming a little bit more organized and it's a great place for my uh, anemones. Yeah. What is my this ritter eye and these bubble tips are just. Whew. Yeah. So I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually really good at not killing things. So I've had this ritter eye for two years. Two years. It used to be so big, and it has shrunk, and now it's actually really coming back since I've, uh, I've really started hitting it with. Um, uh, direct feeding of rich foods, yeah. as well as dosing nitrates to the system. Over here, you'll see two nexus burst anemones. So I had one and it split. Um, and actually very recently, it started getting some of those white speckles, um, really pretty. And then if we'll trade off, Evan, you come in here. The uh, sunburst anemone here has been in the process of splitting for th almost four weeks. Almost four weeks. You're a it, patient guy, man. I would have well, hit that with the razor blade, but it's kind of fun to watch it do its thing. Right? Yeah, I just kind of want to let it do its thing, and it's just got a little thread of tissue left, and just, you know, whatever, let it do its thing. The only reason to speed up the, 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 the splitting process is feeding, right? While it's splitting, it doesn't really have a mouth, yeah. so I haven't been able to feed it. So I think I just wanted to see this one time how long it would take, and next time it does this, once it's stretched, I'm just going to go in there with the scissors so it can go ahead and heal, reform its mouth, so that way I can start feeding it. And this is a bunch of Duncan. I've been growing this Duncan for years. We got one giant strain going all the way across here. And then this is the 30-year-old uh, Duncan strain. I've grown almost as long, but I didn't grow it as fast as this one right here. Yeah, I gave up. I had a Duncan colony much more in this type of color morph, and I just... It grew big and I thought, eh, 
you know, but had it had the level of coloration of the older strain, mm -hmm. I would have probably had a different opinion. Uh, you know, Duncan corals will always be super special to me. Because of the history, yeah. Unobtainium. Yeah, it was. Before Australia for a long opened time. up, it was not even on the menu, right? And so now we come to the last or first, depending on how you look at it, um, Acropora system. And this thing experiences very strong daylight. Um, you can see the blue hoaxamides are just totally popping. We've got five large, uh, very large yellow tangs. Uh, lined rabbit fish. I think there's two chevrons and one purple and then uh, one long fin. We got a long fin clownfish back here. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. He's been he's living here for about two years. He was actually quite aggressive to the other clownfish because all the clownfish were in here to begin with. And then, um, man, let's start with the newest coral. This is a ac uh, Acropora tutuilensis that I got from my buddy Taka. This is a tank grown colony. Very, very cool. That thing's crazy. Very, very nice. I think I got a, it's collecting a little bit of detritus in some of its pockets. So I might put it, might switch it out with the, the Montipora hispida there, just so I can get a little bit more water flow. And um, here's the humulus wave breakers I was talking about. So I do have a clover nozzle on here so that it really helps to push the flow. And so these humulus have done really well. I think this is a gemifera. This guy used to be teal blue, but when I started dosing just any bit of nitrates, he was all like, nah, fam. <laughs> He's just like, all right, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to purplish mauve. And um, well, one thing that I think really helps this tank is I have six Radeon Gen 4 Pros, but they're in two separate banks. Right, so you have a lot of that light overlap, and for sure in the future I want to put another. Uh, in the future I want to upgrade these to Gen 5s, but instead of using six XR30s, I'll probably do four XR15s. What, just to be able to have more control on how staggered it is. I mean, the XR15 is just so bright. Yeah. The, the, sorry, the Gen 5s are just so bright. There is no, almost no reason you should use an XR30 for any tank now. Unless you I had a know. question. Yeah, I could, based on the, the way that the lens now is, and it's more of a distributed panel, I was curious how one of those stacks up to an older Gen XR30. You know, I, you know, I, I would put money on an XR15 Gen 5 being every bit as bright as a XR30 Gen 4. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but having, uh, you know, what I'd like to do is put an XR15 everywhere you see a, a XR30 right now, but then put another one right there in the middle, and the, they'll be lower down because like they don't here, punch as much. one there. Yeah, just to kind of fill in a little bit. Gotcha. Um, yeah. But yeah, this is kind of the uncompromising uh, par tank. So the par levels in the center with no lights over them, right? They're only on the sides. Par in the center peaks at about 600 micromoles. Wow. And I'm still not running the whites at full, full, full on brightness. You know, I, I got real preachy about sort of taking a break from SBS and, you know, been there, done that. And then I came here on Monday and it was this tank and, of course, some of your other display tanks that I went. I went back to the family house and uh, I was like, man, <laughs> you definitely like stoked that fire again a little bit. I, uh, it, you know. Acropora specifically in peak health. Yeah, there's just something about it. Um, but this leather, again, you've got these weird, where there's not like a zillion polyps, right? Like like where it's not like a lawn of polyps. Yeah. Like that is the. Yeah. So this one's that, funny because <laughs> I collected this in Australia. He sheds branches. I've never fragged him. I have frags of it everywhere, right? So this one is almost like an in betweener. Um, from like sarcophytum to lobophytum. So the polyps yeah. look like lobophytum, the crown looks like sarcophytum, and then it has this pseudo branches at the edges of the crown where it looks like fingers. And the first time I saw that in Australia, I thought for sure something was eating it. Yeah. Or something had ate, you know, just come on and mess Cleared with it. But then polyps. I saw it again and again, and I'm like, oh, all right, that must be its thing. That's a cool coral. Yeah, and then I uh, got a few giant clams over here. Um, kind of a token spot for them, just super highlight. I've tried them in some other tanks, but I, I, this, this is the way I can enjoy them the most, really that top-down look. This is um, Acropora aculeus I've had forever, also collected that in Australia. I know it's just a green coral, but it's like super bushy, super green, crazy polyps out all the time. Well, it's like green slime or green, but with that type of growth, you know, yeah. which is cool. 
yeah, that guy's pretty much ready to, to split up into two. But yeah, there's a nice you know, variety of corals in here. We got a couple of the frags up here. And this is one coral that I almost threw away like six months ago. I had this thing for two years before it finally woke up and decided to be this really neat kind of like, not thick, but like a medium branching staghorn. I have yeah. no idea what the species is. I do believe it was from Tonga. Um, and I know it's still green, but it's like a jade green fading into pinkish tips. Just a really neat coral that has finally decided to start thriving. And uh, I, just, I just love it for that reason. What about this guy? I mean, he sort of reminds me of some of the yellow torts that have come out over the years. Yeah, so you know, there's a famous coral um, called the uh, Worldwide Corals um, a Yellow Tip Stag. Okay. Which is green with blue margins and a yellow tip. I'm sure I have a piece in here. Where, where is it at? Where is it at? Where is it at? I see this guy. Is that same? Yes. Or? So this okay. is the Worldwide Corals Yellow Tip Stag. And so if you describe this coral and you describe this coral to someone, they're the exact same, except this one grows more staggy, thick, more like a classic Ostera. Yeah. And then this one, I don't know if it's a hybrid, but the branches are, are thinner and it grows faster. Um, the tip and the blue isn't as brilliant, but it's, they're like the exact same, they're like cousins. They're like, yeah. you know, same kind of thing going on. Yeah, that's, the, the yellow tips drew me to it. And you do see like near, near those tips, you see a little bit of blue there on the, uh, Coralites. Yeah, no, if you saw frags of each of these, you would not be able to tell them apart. When I do make frags, it's only through a lot of time of growing it that I, I know what I'm dealing with. And here you can see one of those frags of the raggedy leather that just found a spot to grow. That's hilarious, yeah. Very funny. And it, you know what, when I, when I collected it, it was brown. Really? It was totally brown. It was only after captivity that it started turning green. You need to give that a, a a name. Oh, the, the next willow? Yeah, yeah, you got the weeping, weeping willow. Give that a name that, you know, propagates the way uh, other names have gone. That is probably one of the rarest corals in the aquarium hobby. That is Palau Estrella, bro. That's a piece I collected in Solomon Islands. Looks, it's closely related. It looks a lot like Stylophora. It does. And um, it's not. The, 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 the branches are so dense. So that's a Montipora, right? No, it's Wait. a Palau Estrella. Oh, I thought that was the uh, species name, my bad. No, the genus is Palau Estrella. The skeleton is extremely dense. It is. I mean, that's as colorful as it gets, but that coral can grow in the brightest light and the dimmest light. No joke, right behind you, I have a frag that's been bouncing around the sump, still alive for a year, no, <laughs> no light. I have no idea how it lives. It's just, it's a totally different animal. Down that here thing, in the sun? Yeah. Wow. We'll, we'll, we'll touch that yeah, in the yeah. next segment. But yeah, so, you know, nice range of corals. None of them are hype, but. This guy a, reminds me of the uh, old Elias, Steve Elias blue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if it is. I, don't, I can't keep up anymore. But, that's, uh, that's the Herida that I collected in Australia. Okay. Kind of baby blue with some purple tips. And this is um, a hobby. Um, Harita, a little bit more greenish tips, a little bit more pink. Very fun coral. And so these two systems right here, they're in line with the entire system. So this is connected to this and uh, those four tanks. And this tank obviously is in loop with this system right here. Yeah, I love this little tank. And almost all the mineral balance is being provided by the Twin Tech Calcium Reactor from Dell Tech. This thing is super dope. Um, this is the only, this is the closest thing I have to a controller in the entire studio, <laughs> but it's just so nice. If I want more calcium or alkalinity, boom, just turn it up, turn it down. It, it's so thoughtless. There's no pH probe. There's no calibration. Um, it just really, really works. I love that thing. I like how they tackle the CO2 mixing too. Yeah, that Reminds thing is, me of those old ozone reactors, you know? Yep, yep, yep. And then um, this is the uh, Christmas tree worm rock tank, which has turned into also a, uh, a, a flower pot uh, grow out area. So I have not been able to lose a frag of flower pot coral in the last couple of years. So we've got all the Ganyaporas over here. These are the older ones, obviously. They're bigger. That's, this is a piece of the herlock. Oh. That Herlock's Ganyapora is like 15 years old, still cranking. Um, over here, I've got a purple branching uh, Ganyapora. 
And then back there is what's left of my maze balls, which has been <laughs> in the process of dying for almost a year and now finally coming back, that guy right there. And then you'll notice these four guys right here, this is Bernard Pora. So this is not Ghania Pora. Um, they're always like a shade of red or something, and they're more encrusting. They won't, the, the polyps won't quite get as large. Yep. And you know, I just love my, my classic uh, zoanthids. To me, purple people leader, still the best. Still the freaking best. These are snake polyps. So we, I think there's two species. We've got the tuberculatus here. This is a St. Patrick's Day Saint poly uh, snake polyps. They're green with orange bumps. Um, we've got one over here that's a little bit more tealy green. And then this one's a lot more smooth. Um, and dude, snake polyps are just one of those weirdest animals because they're actually super shallow water. They're intertidal. And at, during the day, they look stupid. They just, they just collapse down. As soon as the lights go off, they stand up and they have a bright white mouth, all of them. Like yeah. it, they look like a totally different coral as soon as the lights go off. It's the strangest thing. So they're like, we know that they're photosynthetic, right? They need that light, but they're also NPS because at night they really open up and eat a bunch of food. Yeah. And um, let's see, for this tank, we're using um, a, uh, let's see, this is the Max Pack Razor, a three foot razor. I think it's got really great color. Um, you'll see we have like a big uh, partition right here and the Nero 5 um, that cycles through a few different uh, phases and modes. Yeah, I like this little tank. Yeah, Was so this a uh, Cyphastria? I see some, some hints of Cyphastria still growing on it or um, so we got Parites, Parites, Parites. This one was Cyphastria. Almost all the colony died back. There's one little patch here yeah, that I has kept that. up. I see a lot of sponge, like the sponge probably won out. Yeah, no, that coral, no, when I got that, the, oh. the coral was already on the way down. Gotcha, yeah. So I did put a Pavona decusata on there. I'm pretty sure it's encrusted a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I need to take care of some of these big old freaking um, uh, bubble algaes. But I, I would like to repopulate that with Bizarro Cyphastria. That would be cool. I think that would look really cool. So it's mostly denuded now, um, but I need to find a place to put this chunk of Pavona, and then I'll, I'll have some room to put the uh, Bizarro Cyphastria. Yeah, that's just a fun thing that you never see as a collection of Christmas tree worms, you yeah. know, multiple rocks like that. Yeah, for, for real. People ask me how often I feed them. And like, sometimes I feed them three times a day, and sometimes I don't feed them for three weeks. Yeah. You know, there's no, this is the, f the tank where I, I feed the um, kept the bread yellow tanks quite a bit. They're not used to this much attention, so that's why they're hiding. But one thing to point out is on the drain, instead of putting a valve, I just literally constricted it, right? So I went from one inch to half inch, yeah. and then I just pinched that enough so I have the continuous siphon overflow so it's not gurgling and sucking in air. And you and still it, have the backup as well. Just yeah, and there's still, obviously there's still a backup. Um, and then it's just, just being driven by a regular maxi jet. And then my shy blue linkia and abalone.